Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special coverage of China's annual political season. I'm Zhong Shi, live in Beijing. In about half an hour, Wang Yi, a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee and China's foreign minister, will meet journalists at the media center in Beijing. He will take questions on China's foreign policy and diplomatic relations. We'll bring you live coverage of that. Make sure you stay with us right here on CGTN. But for now, CGTN reporter Dong Xue joins me live from the media center in Beijing. Dong Xue, this is one of the most watched press conferences throughout the course of the two sessions. A lot of attention on future diplomacy that China has to offer. What can we expect from the news conference? Exactly, Zhong Shi, as you mentioned, in about 20 minutes or so, political bureau member of the political bureau of the CPC Central Committee, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, is set to meet the press to review China's foreign policies and external relations. And as you can see, probably behind me, you know, the conference hall is packed with the journalists from both home and overseas. Well, the briefing will be closely watched not only by us as reporters, but China watchers and many others from across the globe amid global tensions and crisis in Gaza, Ukraine and elsewhere. Well, the briefing is likely to touch on China's ties with the United States, which have improved since last year's leaders meeting in San Francisco. But the Biden administration's latest move to curb China's electrical vehicles shows the extent of the challenges in stabilizing one of the world's most important bilateral relations. And there's also China's ties with Russia, which Beijing has repeatedly said that are based on principles of non-alliance, non-confrontation, as well as the non-targeting of third parties. And despite, you know, the mounting pressure from the West for China to take a harder stance against Moscow. And as for the EU, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has recently made a trip to Europe, visiting France, Spain and Germany to obviously sending a signal to reduce the re region's reliance on the United States. And also emerging voices in the Global South are another issue expected to be covered in this pre in this press conference, as it accounts for 40% of the of the world uh, global GDP. Excuse me. With the expansion of the BRICS last year, the Global South has become a voice that cannot no longer be ignored. With the many countries taking clear stances, especially on geopolitical issues. For instance, Brazil condemned the Hamas attack on Israel, but has since made its voice heard by taking a hard diplomatic line on Tel Aviv and South Africa fired, filed a case to the International Criminal Court arguing Israel is breaching the UN Convention on Genocide by killing Palestinians in Gaza and of course China continues to call for a two-state solution to be implemented soon a position backed by many other countries in the global south and also we're expecting you know uh, Wang Yi to give out the China's uh, stance on the artificial intelligence regulations for the world and the uh, and, the, and a lot of other uh, hot regional issues. Zhong Shi. So much to cover. Dong Xie will be monitoring that press conference here and hope to check back in with you later. Thank you so much for that preview. CGTN's Dong Xie at the Media Center. And China's diplomacy has been in full swing since the beginning of 2023, from bilateral and multilateral meetings to regional and global forums. China has continued to promote common prosperity and a more just international order, ensuring its achievements with the world. China's willingness to share development dividends was vividly demonstrated through a number of major diplomatic events the country hosted last year. Among them are the China Central Asia Summit in May and the Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation in October. The first China Central Asia Summit saw the heads of state of the five Central Asian countries gather in northwestern city of Xi'an. It was the first in-person summit between the two sides over 31 years since China established diplomatic relations with these countries. This summit has built a new platform and opened up new prospects for China-Central Asia cooperation. And China is willing to take this summit as an opportunity to work closely with all parties to plan, build and develop China-Central Asia cooperation well. During the summit, China and the Central Asian countries signed seven bilateral and multilateral documents, as well as over a hundred cooperation agreements in various fields. 
China also proposed to establish more dialogue mechanisms in various fields so as to boost mutually beneficial cooperation. In Beijing, some 10,000 representatives from over 150 countries and 30 international organizations gathered for the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation. It's the most important diplomatic event hosted by China in 2023, as the year also marked the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative was proposed by China. The achievements and opportunities brought by John Lee building it belong to the world. That was proven by a total of 458 outcomes, with total cooperation agreements worth some 97 billion U.S. dollars for 2023. The initiative, jointly built by all partners, has delivered nearly a trillion U.S. dollars of investment in the past decade. It also brought about some 420,000 jobs in member countries. The Belt and Road Initiative has brought a new path for the world to realize modernization. These diplomatic practices in 2023 demonstrate China's commitment to global cooperation and development. Gao Yiming, CGTN. Let's talk about all of this with my panel here in the studio. Uh, Dr. Zhao, Dr. Carvalho, uh, Wang Yi called 2023 a year of profound changes in international relations. And obviously, China had to adjust and adapt to those changes. In terms of the report card from last year, Dr. Zhao, uh, what is your assessment of China's role in adjusting to those international changes? I think the year of 2023 is a year of great contrast. On the one hand, you have war, you have uh, regional instability, you have conflicts, confrontations, geopolitical tensions all around the world. But on the other hand, you have China continue to promote uh, prosperity, cooperation, uh, and a good spirit and just international system. On that, uh, you have just mentioned two big meetings, China with uh, Central Asia and also uh, the third uh, international forum on BRI. Uh, and other than that, China has done a lot to bridge uh, you know, previous uh, countries who have differences like Saudi Arabia and Iran. And also later on, uh, after the outbreak of the Gaza incident, China called for uh, a peaceful solution of this uh, conflict. And uh, there are many things uh, China is also promoting, like um, try to bring uh, Ukraine and Russia back together and negotiate a settlement on that issue too. So I think China has been very active on the global stage and trying to uh, you know, bring uh, the world together in this very uh, unpredictable, unstable international system. It's very difficult to bring that sane voice, that neutral voice, when there are simply so many hostilities regionally and also in terms of economic trade relations, in terms of diplomatic relations. Dr. Cavallo, can I ask about your take on China's role last year as well? In fact, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Zhao uh, that uh, China has overcome uh, several difficulties and challenges on the diplomatic front. And China stayed committed to the peaceful development based on mutual respect and also win cooperation. But the most important thing is China is developing a Chinese style of diplomacy, a new type of international relations, or at least China is trying to you know, build this new type of international relations, uh, committed to the peaceful coexistence of the countries, and uh, especially the respect of the sovereignty, and the no interference or international affairs or internal affairs of the countries. But I'd like to say that China is also developing you know, new concepts, new methods, new initiatives. So the concept, for example, the community of shared future for mankind, where harmony is a core concept on this. And the Western countries needed to understand the real meaning of this concept. Uh, Concrete initiatives, the Belt and Road Cooperation is one of this, you know, the, the, the global development initiatives, the global security initiative, global civilization, civilization initiatives. So uh, it's a menu uh, a repertoire of initiatives, concepts, and methods that China is developing in the recent years, and it's, this is totally new. Mm. This is the reason why I agree with the President Xi Jinping that China, you know, is approaching. Uh, the center of the global stage, mm. not to be, not to adopt a, a, a hegemony attitude, but to, to uh, 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 how can I say, 
to assume more responsibilities in the international arena. And this is totally new. With great power comes great responsibilities. And we'll be finding out more details about China's style of diplomacy later in our program, um, characterized by major country diplomacy and, of course, China's relations with members of the Global South. Gentlemen, stay with me here on our program. Thank you so much. And CDTN correspondent Panina Karibe has traveled from Nairobi to cover the two sessions in Beijing. She joins me now from the media center. Uh, Panina, can I begin by extending a belated welcome to you? Fascinating reports you've been delivering uh, during your stay here in Beijing. Share with us your experiences covering the two sessions this year. Well, it is my first time to cover the two sessions and I have to say it's been an incredible experience for me. It's been a learning experience. Prior to me coming to Beijing, first of all, I have to say it was a bit difficult for me to actually grasp uh, what the two sessions is all about, how the CPCC works and how the NPC works. What is the difference between the two bodies, the NPC and the CPCC, and what are the roles of the two bodies? And while I was here, I actually was able to understand that deeper. I have to say that uh, some of this information somebody could very easily say, oh, but you can look up on the internet and understand, but absolutely not. You actually have to be here. You have to interact with the Chinese people to be able to truly understand what these two sessions is about. I think for me, the biggest takeaway is also the democratic process of, of the whole event. Uh, you know, it opened up my eyes as to how this political season for China truly is. And for me, what I saw was a truly, uh, you know, accountability to the people, just getting to understand who the NPC deputies are, that these are not professional politicians, but they are your ordinary people. It could be the farmer from the remote part of China. It could be somebody who is so successful, maybe in manufacturing, but they are people who truly represent the ordinary Chinese. And they come here in Beijing during the two sessions. They get to articulate the, uh, the things that they feel are important to the people. The CPCC as well, these are people who understand what it is the people want they seek the opinions of the people they come here they make suggestions to the npc and so the npc considers those proposals and they get to formulate the laws that will support those proposals the other thing that i took i can take away from my experience covering the two sessions is also the accountability of both bodies to the press. I got the advantage of attending press conferences of both the CPCC and the NPC and it was remarkable for me just seeing them dedicate a whole hour, sometimes an hour plus, to just accepting questions from the media. And most of these journalists were actually, you know, representing the local media houses here in China, asking the CPCC, for example, what did you people do in 2023? What were your biggest accomplishments that you set the targets for this and that in the previous year? Where are we now? Hearing as well those questions being posed to the NPC, what laws did you formulate to support the proposals that were made by the CPCC last year, for example? And so for me, that showed democracy, number one, but it also showed responsibility and accountability to the ordinary Chinese person. Panina, we appreciate that update from you. Of course, we will continue to look forward to more of your reports throughout the two sessions. Thank you so much. And 2023 has also witnessed some important diplomatic events between China and the U.S. And that includes President Xi's meeting with President Joe Biden in San Francisco last November. And for more on that, our correspondent Poppy Mputing joins me from Washington. Poppy, help us review China-U.S. relations in 2023 and where they're likely headed this year. Well, this year's two sessions is pivotal for China-U.S. relations. Washington has been accused of trying to limit Beijing's growth. Well, relations improved after San Francisco when President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden met last year. This is the first two sessions held since that meeting, and it marks the last to be held before the U.S. presidential election. Now, in relation to the future, the U.S. markets are closely watching developments. There are several areas of particular interest to U.S. observers. Uh, advancements in the technology sector, economic priorities, as well as military spending. Now, China announced it's boosting the annual science and technology budget by 10 percent, a huge injection of more than $51 billion. 
China has pulled ahead of the U.S. in this regard. Apple's iPhone sales have plunged in the first six weeks of 2024, and that's compared to last year. The U.S. tech giant's chief competitor, Huawei, has seen sales rise by 64 percent, conversely. Now, there's also focus on AI and big data competition as China invests in new programs and infrastructure. Well, zeroing in on the economy, investors note that China's 5 percent growth target for this year indicates a commitment to stability. China's plan involves issuing ultra-long special bonds to local governments. Now, there's also interest in how funds will contribute to infrastructure development. Investors are watching possible stimulus programs, too, that could emerge to bolster consumer spending. Chinese Premier Li Xiang announced China's central government hopes to add more than 12 million new urban jobs. Now, another point of interest is that China's military budget is the largest in the world, the second largest, I should say. And this week, it did indeed announce a 7% increase, roughly the same as last year. Back to you. All right, Poppy, we appreciate that review from you. Thank you so much. China has a deep and long history with the European Union with billions of dollars in trade every single day. The bloc is also a key ally in the fight against climate change. And as CGTN's Tony Waterman reports from Paris, France plays a key role in that relationship. This year, China and France mark 60 years of diplomatic relations. And Paris was actually the first major Western capital to recognize China during the Cold War, opening the door for the rest of Europe to follow. And the relationship has deepened and expanded through the decades. Bilateral trade was nearly $80 billion last year, a dip from previous years. But China is still France's largest trading partner in Asia. And both countries are also deep sources of investment for the other, particularly in technology, aviation, and infrastructure. Chinese firm AESC, for example, is currently building a gigafactory in northern France, which, when completed next year, will churn out up to 200,000 electric car batteries a year. While in China, French aircraft giant Airbus is building a second final assembly line, which will double its A320 production capacity in the country. The relationship between the two countries is one of the strongest in Europe, as seen during French President Emmanuel Macron's state visit to China last year. And Beijing is hoping Paris can be a stabilizing voice in the EU, where tensions with China have grown since the pandemic. One pain point is an ongoing EU probe into whether Chinese EV makers are benefiting from state subsidies, something the car makers and Beijing have denied. China, meanwhile, has launched an anti-dumping investigation into EU brandy imports. That being said, China and the EU remain close partners, and last year marked the 20th anniversary of the China-EU Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. And trade has increased tenfold during that time, with an average of more than $2 billion worth of goods being traded every single day. And at the China-EU summit in December, both sides agreed to maintain strategic stability and work together on addressing global challenges like climate change. Change. China is also offering visa-free entry to Dutch, French, German, Italian, and Spanish nationals this year in a bid to promote more people-to-people -people exchanges. Tony Waterman, CGTN, Paris, France. Let's talk about all of these relations with my guests here in the studio. Gentlemen, the highlight of China-U.S. relations last year really was that summit meeting between the two presidents in San Francisco. And there was that San Francisco vision, obviously. Dr. Zhao, let me start with you. What do you think has transpired? What has changed after that meeting in San Francisco? Well, prior to the San Francisco meeting, we noticed that in 2023, uh, China-U.S. relations has been uh, bumpy after the so-called balloon incident. Uh, and after that, U.S. side is trying to mend the relationship. And gradually uh, coming up, you know, uh, uh, after the repair of the uh, relationship, it, 
cultivated into uh, this uh, summit in San Francisco. So the aim of the meeting is try to stabilize the relationship and trying to reestablish people-to-people relations and also uh, regular communication channels. And for that purpose, I would say it's, it's quite successful. So, so far after that summit, you have seen uh, regular meetings uh, on uh, economic relations, on uh, financial issues, on diplomatic and even military-to-military -military relations. So that's been uh, quite successful after that summit. Uh, however, on the other side, we also seen that the U.S. Uh, perception on China has not changed. Uh, Chinese side has demanded the U.S. try to have the right perception of China's strategic goal. However, the U.S. side be still believe that China is the biggest challenge, biggest threat to U.S. national security. So for that matter, U.S. Uh, insist on limiting uh, technology export to China and also on geopolitical arena, the U.S. still try to compete and also try to push back on China. That created tensions uh, not only in front of China's door doorsteps uh, on the issue of uh, you know, peninsula, uh, the Taiwan cross Taiwan relations, uh, Taiwan Strait relations, and also in South China Sea, we've seen a lot of lot of uh, hot spots. But also globally, in many areas where China the US, and the U.S. should uh, cooperate with each other in trying to promote peace and justice, the U.S. side is not uh, a willing to accept a bigger role of China, and therefore created sort of a vacuum on global governance. So moving forward, I think not only China and U.S. should maintain and follow the vision of San Francisco, but also to build on, uh, on top of that and have a, a better understanding of where they can work together uh, and promote world peace and prosperity. Uh, however, uh, we also um, have that in mind, which is that the U.S. is in this uh, campaign election season, and uh, who is going to be the next president is still a question mark. And therefore, I think uh, for a better relationship or a better outcome for the future, we still have to wait and see what's going to be uh, happening in the U.S. And after the, uh, the, the election. Dr. Carvalho, uh, how would you characterize the San Francisco vision? How much do you agree with Dr. Zhao here? Because um, it seems that the relationship is now back on a smoother track. We're not going to say, you know, a, a, a completely different track here. But they're certainly on a smoother track with both sides agreeing to upgrade and improve relations, obviously. What do you make of what has been achieved in San Francisco? Yes, we expect that they agree to establish a common ground in order to develop a bilateral relation that is good for both and also to the world. But sometimes I think that, you know, U.S. discourse, there is a gap between the U.S. discourse and the U.S. attitude. And also a kind of a different dictionary. So sometimes uh, China talks about competition in the market. And uh, the attitude of the United States is about confrontation in the market. So China tried to promote the multilateralism, the inclusive multilateralism, and the attitude of the United States sometimes is, you know, is more unilateral, and not to strengthen the international organizations. And China all the time tried to discuss a reform of the a, a, a global uh, international system. So in order to, uh, to promote this multilateralism and, in, and include more countries in the decision-making process. So, uh, there is an agenda. Of course, they need to understand one each other uh, because there is an interdependence of the economy uh, among these two countries. And, uh, but sometimes I think that uh, you know, uh, the way uh, China and U.S. try to you know, approach their position is a little bit different, especially because of this difference. Uh, between one and all in terms of uh, dictionary, grammar, diplomatic attitude. So now uh, it's, it's clear that the Cold War mentality is completely, you know, deep on the American society and, and in a certain way this uh, creates uh, several obstacles to the American government to open, you know, a very, uh, a very positive dialogue with China. So. We just expect that this kind of summit become more frequent in order to, uh, to open um, a more uh, positive uh, diplomacy. It's very unfortunate that that high level of interdependence in the economies between the two countries hasn't really prevented 
uh, noises and voices of de-risking and decoupling between both countries. Dr. Da, I do want to ask a question of China-EU relations, um, which have a different set of priorities and problems from China-US relations. They are each other's second largest trading partners as of 2022, so trade obviously is a big issue here. So when you see European leaders, including the French president visiting China last year, uh, trade was very high on their agenda. Um, what do you make of the current momentum of trade between China and the EU, and how can both sides work better on this issue? Well, it's interesting because EU has its own strategy on China, which divide into three roles. Uh, one is a partner uh, on climate change and other major global issues, and one is competitor on technology and economic issues, and also one is systematic rival. Uh, so I think uh, EU is sort of trying to figure out exactly how to deal with China uh, and then they come up with the uh, notion of de-risking, and the U.S., of, of course, follow that up, also pirating that word. Uh, however, they, until now, uh, EU and the United States cannot explain exactly what is de-risking. And on Chinese part, we're saying that de-risking means that uh, uh, business to business, they try to diversify and try to uh, prepare for any uh, unexpected impact like the pandemic. It's not de-China, de uh, meaning uh, kicking China out of the supply chain. Uh, so I think the EU-China relationship is very uh, complex. On the one hand, we have a very deep root economic uh, cooperation, economic relationship, which is mutually uh, supplemental. However, on the other hand, we have other issues. Uh, I think uh, it's also um, uh, trying to destabilize the re relationship, particularly the uh, intervention of the U.S. and right now the NATO issue, uh, I think, are, uh, are uh, seeping into the agenda of the EU relations towards China. So I think moving forward, it's uh, quite important for uh, these kind of summit, including uh, uh, you know uh, high-level visits from EU uh, uh, and also high-level visits from China to EU, but also the summit uh, of EU-China relations is also very important, uh, playing a key role in leading this relationship forward. And I think uh, ultimately the EU should come up with, with a unified stance on China, exactly uh, how to um, respect China's sovereignty, you know, uh, cooperating with China more closely on economic issues, but also trying to iron out the difference uh, between China on major issues on global governance. So it's critically important uh, that China and EU cooperate in this chaotic world. In this year's uh, 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 Munich uh, Security Conference, I think Europe is quite pessimistic about this lose-lose relationship in the world uh, on uh, big power relations. But in order to uh, come out of or supersede this kind of pessimism, I think it's, uh, again, m uh, very important for EU and China to work together on uh, setting up the rules uh, for the future of the world and also follow those rules, uh, uh, preventing uh, any other you know, country trying to uh, destroy or deviate uh, from the international standards uh, mm. of, and, and these rules. Dr. Cavallo, uh, Dr. Tell mentioned the word de-risk here. In terms of China-EU relations, is de-risking a game of words, or is the European Union com compartmentalizing, you know, where we want to double down on what works with China and where we want to emphasize on our differences? And in terms of a unified stance mentioned by Dr. Dow, what could that stance look like in future relations? That's a good question, because in the beginning they started to talk about decoupling, so it's kind of a strategy. And that was a very unpopular concept. Exactly. So very unpopular uh, concept, because uh, sounds like, you know, uh, to isolate China from the global market. And now they are talking about the risking, so we don't know if they are choosing a new expression to, uh, to refer to the same content or if they are really thinking about another content uh, connected to this world, the risking, and then let's discuss about this. Of course, after or during the pandemic, all countries uh, were uh, uh, worried about, you know, to diversify the, the, their supply chains. It is normal. So we can understand uh, the risking in this way is totally uh, understandable. But using this word to uh, surmount more tariffs, no tariffs, barriers uh, uh, against the Chinese products, for example, or also to continue that policy to isolate China from the global market, this is unfair. This is against the World Trade Organization rules. So uh, th th this is the reason why uh, they must choose the dialogue. 
to discuss all these topics and uh, in order to understand and improve you know, their, their understanding about this kind of policy. So de-risking must be uh, more explained by the Western countries. Mm. I mean, your background is in a law and international law. Um, in terms of the EU's concerns about the imports of Chinese products, particularly Chinese um, new energy vehicles, are those concerns warranted? Yes, the Chinese government said that uh, uh, there weren't subsidies, you know, to this sector. So, but anyway, if the European Union wants to discuss this, must bring this issue to the World Trade Organization and discuss this according to the rules that regulates the international trade. So this is the way they, they need to solve, all countries has, have to solve their commercial and trade problems and not weaponize you know, these uh, trade topics in the international politics. Thank you so much. We'll be talking later on in our program. And now, Wang Yi, a member of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee and Chinese Foreign Minister, is meeting with journalists at the Media Center in Beijing. He'll be answering questions on China's foreign policy and diplomatic relations. Of course, this is a very popular and one of the most watched press conferences throughout the two sessions, where we will likely hear questions regarding China's diplomacy in the last year and, of course, see directions of China's diplomacy going into 2024 in terms of major country relations and China's relations with other developing countries. Friends from the media, good morning. Welcome to this press conference for the second session of the 14th National People's Congress. Our topic today is China's foreign policy and external relations. We are delighted to have with us Mr. Wang Yi, member of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee and Foreign Minister. He will brief you and take up your questions. Thank you. Friends from the media, good morning. I'm very pleased to meet you again during the NPC and CPPCC sessions. I heard that you arrived here very early. I salute your hard work. The world landscape today is undergoing profound transformation, and human society is confronted with multiple challenges. In this changing and turbulent international environment, China will remain a staunch force for peace, stability, and the progress of the world. In his report to the 20th National Congress of the CPC, General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out that although this is an era fraught with challenges, it is also an era brimming with hope. China will stand firmly on the right side of history and on the side of human progress and will advocate vigorously peace, development, cooperation and mutual benefit. It will pursue its development along with its efforts for peace and development of the world. And at the same time, it will make greater contributions to world peace and development through its own development. It was also in stressed in the report that the CPC is dedicated both to pursuing happiness for the Chinese people and rejuvenation for the Chinese nation and to promoting human progress and world harmony. That is our mission and our duty. It is also our aspiration and our goal. With that, I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. First question, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, 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 去年年底呢，举行了中央外事工作会议。这次会议认为，中国特色大国外交将进入一个可以更有作为的新阶段。那么，您能否透露一下，今年中国外交会有哪些值得期待的亮点？中国外交会在哪些方面更有作为？谢谢。China Central Television, Foreign Minister Wang, could you talk us through China's most impressive diplomatic achievements in the past year? 
At the Central Conference on Work Relating to Foreign Affairs, it was pointed out that major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristics would enter a new stage where much more could be accomplished. Could you share with us what highlights we could expect in the year ahead, and in what areas of its diplomacy will China seek to accomplish more? The year 2023 not only witnessed pioneering efforts, but also great harvests in China's diplomacy. Under the strong leadership of the CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at its core, the Chinese Foreign Service fully implemented the guiding principles set forth in the 20th CPC National Congress. We took steps to promote international solidarity and cooperation and offered solutions to crises and challenges. We contributed to world peace and development and broke new ground in China's diplomatic theory and practice. In the past year, President Xi Jinping hosted two major diplomatic events in China, attended three multilateral summits, made four important overseas visits, and had more than 100 meetings and phone calls. Head of state diplomacy is getting increasingly irreplaceable in providing strategic guidance. The Central Asian region and the Indochina Peninsula all embraced the vision of a community with a shared future for mankind, and new progress was made in the joint efforts by China and African, ASEAN, Arab and Latin American and Caribbean countries to realize the same vision. The third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation was a success, taking Belt and Road Cooperation to a new stage of high-quality development. BRICS achieved a historic expansion, opening a new chapter of united strength for the Global South. We facilitated the historic reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Iran and mediated a ceasefire agreement in northern Myanmar. We promoted political settlement of all hotspots and conflicts. We resolutely opposed all hegemonic and bullying acts and effectively safeguarded China's sovereignty, security and development interests, as well as the common interests of developing countries. We conducted diplomacy to serve the Chinese people and to fully support the development and stability of the country. At the Central Conference on Work Relating to Foreign Affairs at the end of last year, President Xi Jinping outlined a comprehensive plan for China's external work for the present and beyond, which was a top-level design for China's diplomatic strategy on the new journey. We'll study and implement the guiding principles of the conference in real earnest. We'll follow the guidance of Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy, focus on building a community with a shared future for mankind, and act with a stronger sense of historical responsibility and a more vibrant spirit of innovation to accomplish more in our major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristics. We'll be more confident and self-reliant in cultivating the features of China's diplomacy. Our national development and rejuvenation will always be based on our own efforts, and the future of the Chinese people will always be in our own hands. We will remain firm in pursuing the independent foreign policy of peace and resolutely safeguard China's sovereignty and national dignity. We will be more open and inclusive and conduct diplomacy with a broad vision. We will consolidate and expand our global network of partnerships, promote a new type of international relations, and promote mutual respect and mutual learning between civilizations. We'll strive for stability in major country relations, common progress with our neighbors, and rejuvenation with fellow countries in the global south. We will uphold fairness and justice and further establish the ethos of China's diplomacy. We will practice true multilateralism and promote greater democracy in international relations. On issues of principle concerning the legitimate rights and interests of developing countries and the future of humanity, we will be more unequivocal and we will shoulder greater moral responsibility and press ahead in the right direction of history. We will promote win-win cooperation and stay true to the ideal of China's diplomacy. We will stay on the right path of seeking solidarity and cooperation, offer more solutions with Chinese wisdom, wisdom to regional hotspots and global issues, and provide more public goods in the interest of world peace and development. 
China's new development will bring about new opportunities to the world. Thank you. Next question. Russia, Sebotnia. Russia, and Sputnik. This year marks the 75th anniversary of diplomatic ties between Russia and China. The bilateral relationship has grown to an unprecedented level in recent years. Given the ongoing global transition in international relations, what do you think is the most effective way to tap the potential of Russia-China cooperation? Under the strategic guidance of President Xi Jinping and President Vladimir Putin, the China-Russia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership of Coordination for the New Era has been moving forward on a high level. Political mutual trust is deepening, cooperation remains mutually beneficial and complementary to each other. The two peoples are enthusiastic about mutual exchanges. Last year, bilateral trade reached the record 240 billion US dollars, hitting the target of 200 billion US dollars ahead of schedule. Russian natural gas is fueling numerous Chinese households, and Chinese-made automobiles are running on Russian roads. All this shows the strong resilience and broad prospects of China-Russia mutually beneficial cooperation. Maintaining and growing the China-Russia relationship is a strategic choice by the two sides, based on the fundamental interests of the two peoples. It is also what we must do to keep pace with the trend of the world. As key major countries of the world and permanent members of the UN Security Council, China and Russia have forged a new paradigm of major country relations that differs entirely from the obsolete Cold War approach. On the basis of non-alliance, non-confrontation, and not targeting any third party, China and Russia strive for lasting good neighborliness and friendship and seek to deepen their comprehensive strategic coordination. In today's world, hegemonism finds no support and division leads nowhere. Major countries should not see confrontation and the Cold War should not be allowed to come back. The China-Russia relationship moves ahead along the trend of the times toward multipolarity and greater democracy in international relations. And is thus very important for maintaining global strategic stability, enabling positive interactions among major countries and promoting cooperation among e emerging major countries. This year marks the 75th anniversary of China-Russia diplomatic relations. The two sides will also jointly launch the China-Russia Years of Culture. The relationship faces new opportunities. China is ready to work with Russia to foster new driving forces for cooperation and steadily enhance the foundation of friendship between the two peoples. With Russia chairing the BRICS mechanism this year and China Taking over the chairship of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in the second half of this year, the two sides will strengthen international and multilateral coordination, practice true multilateralism, uphold the UN-centered international system, and safeguard regional and global security and stability. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank谢主持人。王外长您好，我是人民日报社记者。中央外事工作会指出，构建人类命运共同体是新时代中国特色大国外交追求的崇高目标。近年来，我们看到中国与不少国家宣布共建命运共同体，请问外长，您如何看
How do you see the prospect of building a community with a shared future for mankind? Building a community with a shared future for mankind is the core tenet of Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy. It is China's solution to the question of what kind of world to build and how to build it. President Xi Jinping has stressed many times that humanity live in the same global village and travel in the same boat, facing various global challenges coming our way. Countries should rise above their differences in history, culture, geography and system and work together to protect the Earth, the only inhabitable planet for us all, and make it a better place. This important tenet demonstrates President Xi Jinping's broad historical vision and deep passion for the world as the leader of a major country. It goes beyond the obsolete zero-sum game mentality, assumes the moral high ground of civilization, and captures the shared aspirations of all nations. It points the right direction for humanity at a historical inflection point where accelerated transformation unseen in a century is unfolding across the world. Building a community with a shared future for mankind has become a glorious banner leading the progress of the times. It is also the lofty goal of our major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristics for the new era. It's been ten fruitful years for this vision since President Xi Jinping put it forward. It has developed from a conceptual proposition to a scientific system, from a Chinese initiative to an international consensus, and from a promising vision to practical outcomes, showing strong vitality. From bilateral partners to multilateral institutions, from regional frameworks to global initiatives, and from public health to cyberspace and oceans, China has been building communities with a shared future with scores of countries and regions in multiple forms and domains. Time and again, the vision has been written into UN General Assembly resolutions as well as resolutions and declarations of the SCO, BRICS and other multilateral mechanisms. The evolution of the international situation in recent years shows again and again that the number one reality in today's world is that all countries rise and fall together, and that the short path to meeting the challenges is mutual assistance and win-win cooperation. More and more countries and peoples have come to realize that the future of humanity should be decided by all countries together, and that the future of the world should be built by all peoples together. China is ready to work with all countries to build an open, inclusive, clean and beautiful world of lasting peace, universal security and shared prosperity. The road ahead may be tortuous, but the future is bright. Thank you. Bloomberg, please. Uh, thank you. So, a uh, question from Bloomberg. After last year's meeting in San Francisco, the China and the U.S. agreed to jointly manage differences and promote mutually beneficial cooperation. Uh, since then, the U.S. has continued to increase its trade and technological restrictions. My question is, how does China think this trend will change in the next one to two years? And how does China plan to respond to this? Thank you. Peng Boshe, since the last year, the U.S.-China Trade Association Trade Association Trade Association the China-U.S. relationship is critical to the well-being of the two peoples and to the future of humanity and the world. No matter how the international landscape evolves, China always keeps its U.S. policy stable and consistent and always handles the relationship with a sense of responsibility for history, for the people and for the world. Our position is the three principles proposed by President Xi Jinping. Mutual respect, 
peaceful coexistence and win-win cooperation. They are a statement of the experiences and lessons of the 50 plus years of China-US relations and represent the right way for interactions between major countries. They should be observed and acted upon by both sides. Specifically, mutual respect is the precondition because Interaction sustains only when differences in social and political systems are respected and acknowledged. Peaceful coexistence is the baseline, because conflict and confrontation between two major countries like China and the US have unimaginable consequences. Win-win cooperation is the goal, because when working together, China and the US can do great things conducive to the two countries and the world. At the historic meeting in San Francisco last November, the two presidents reached common understandings and charted the course for stabilizing the China-US relationship and bringing it back on the track of sound development. President Xi Jinping elaborated on China's fundamental approach and principled position on developing relations with the United States. President Biden reiterated that the U.S. does not seek a new Cold War, does not seek to change China's system, does not seek to revitalize its alliance against China, and does not support Taiwan independence. He also stated that the U.S. is glad to see prosperity in China and does not seek to contain or suppress China's development or to decouple with China. There has been some improvements in China-U.S. relations since the summit in San Francisco. This meets the interests and wishes of the people of both countries and the world. But it has to be pointed out that U.S. misperception toward China continues, and U.S. promises are not truly fulfilled. The U.S. has been devising various tactics to suppress China and kept lengthening its unilateral sanctions list, reaching bewildering levels of unfathomable absurdity. If the U.S. says one thing and does another, where is its credibility as a major country? If it gets jittery whenever it hears the word China, where is its confidence as a major country? If it only wants itself to prosper, but denies other countries' legitimate development, where is international fairness? If it persistently monopolizes the high end of the value chain and keeps China at the low end, where is fairness in competition? The challenge for the U.S. comes from itself, not from China. If the U.S. is obsessed with suppressing China, it will eventually harm itself. We urge the U.S. to be clear-eyed about the trend of the times, view China's development objectively and rationally, engage in exchanges with China proactively and pragmatically, and to act to fulfill its commitments. We hope that it will work with China to bring the relationship back on the track of stable, sound and sustainable development. This year marks the 45th anniversary of China-U.S. diplomatic relations. President Xi Jinping pointed out that the hope of the China-U.S. relationship lies in the people. Its foundation is in grassroots connections. Its future depends on the youth, and its vitality comes from subnational exchanges. China is always ready to strengthen dialogue and exchanges with the U.S. and promote friendly exchanges in various sectors, so as to build more bridges for mutual understanding and remove unnecessary misunderstanding and biases. We believe that two sides are fully able to find a right path for the two different major countries to get along with each other. Thank you. Next question, please. Hello,我是新华社记者。国际上很多领导人都认为，当今国际秩序未能反映或适应国际现实力量变化，中方提出了倡导平等有序的世界多极化和普惠包容的经济全球化两大主张，受到国际社会广泛关注和支持。您能否
Many leaders around the world believe that the current international order fails to reflect and adapt to the shifting power dynamics of the world. China's proposal to build an equal and orderly multipolar world and a universally beneficial and inclusive economic globalization has drawn wide attention and support from the international community. Could you further elaborate on China's solution to global governance? Multipolarity and economic globalization are the prevailing trends in the advancement of human society. But there are different views on how they should look like. China believes in an equal and orderly multipolar world and a universally beneficial and inclusive economic globalization. An equal multipolar world means equal rights, equal opportunities, and equal rules for every nation. Certain or a few powers should not monopolize international affairs. Countries should not be categorized according to their strength. Those with the bigger fist should not have the final say. And it is definitely unacceptable that certain countries must be at the table while some others can only be on the menu. We must ensure that all countries, regardless of their size and strength, are able to take part in decision-making, enjoy their rights, and play their role as equals in the process toward a multipolar world. An orderly multipolar world means all should observe the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and uphold the universally recognized basic norms governing international relations. Multipolarity doesn't mean multiple blocks of fragmentation or disarray. All countries must act within the UN-centered international system and pursue cooperation under global governance. Universally beneficial globalization means growing the economic pie and sharing it more fairly. All nations, all social groups, and all communities should be able to take part in economic and social development and share the benefits. Development in balance, be it national or international, should be settled properly so as to realize common prosperity and development. Inclusive globalization means supporting countries in pursuing a development path suited to their own national conditions. No one should impose one single development model onto the whole world. Unilateralism and protectionism for selfish gains at expense of others must be discarded to keep the global industrial and supply chains stable and unimpeded and to sustain the robust and dynamic growth of the world economy. China is ready to work with all countries to steer multipolarity and economic globalization toward the right direction as expected by the whole world, and to make global governance more just and equitable. Thank you. Next question, please. Nile News Egyptian Network. Thank you, Mr. President Wing, Mr. Minister Wing. Thank you. I'm Ahmed Mohammed from Egyptian Television. I'm working as a reporter and announcer in Nile News Television. It's a governmental television in Cairo. Uh, from my observing on the ground when covering Palestinian-Israeli conflict on the border with Gaza, I found the people suffering from hunger, stress and the loss of all of safe, lively food. Uh, and another scenes of a large amount of uh, humanitarian aid waiting daily to enter to Gaza. So how, we can, uh, how can the international community provide protection necessary for Palestinian people? And we know Chinese just position on the Palestinian questions has been recommended by Arab countries. What will be the way out of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? What role will China play to this end? Thank you. Aizhi尼罗河电视台,王外长您好,在实地采访中,我发现加沙人民遭受饥饿,生计无着, 每天大量人道主义援助无法进入加沙。国际社会如何为巴勒斯坦人民提供必要保护? 
，中方在巴勒斯坦问题上的公正立场受到了阿拉伯国家的赞赏。结束巴以冲突的未来出路是什么？中国还将为此发挥什么作用？你代表阿拉伯国家，解决问题，我觉得非常重要。And it's a very important question that you've raised on behalf of them. 本轮的巴以冲突 ，the current Palestinian-Israeli conflict has caused over 100,000 civilian casualties, and countless innocent people remain buried under the rubble. There is no distinction between noble and humble lives, and life should not be labeled by race or religion. The failure to end this humanitarian disaster today in the 21st century is a tragedy for humanity and a disgrace for, hum for civilization. Nothing justifies the protraction of the conflict or the killing of the civilian population. The international community must act promptly to promote an immediate ceasefire as its overriding priority and ensure humanitarian assistance as its pressing moral obligation. People in Gaza have the right to life in this world. And women and children deserve the care from their families. All detainees should be released, and all actions that harm civilians should be stopped. The calamity in Gaza is another wake-up call for the world, that the long occupation of the Palestinian territories is a fact that should not be ignored anymore, and that the long-cherished aspiration of the Palestinians for an independent state should not be evaded anymore. More importantly, the historical injustice to the Palestinians must not be allowed to continue uncorrected from generation to generation. Restoring justice to the Palestinian people and fully implementing the two-state solution is the only way to break the vicious cycle of Palestinian-Israeli conflicts, to eliminate the breeding ground of extremist ideologies, and to realize enduring peace in the Middle East. China firmly supports the Palestinian people's just cause of regaining their legitimate national rights and is always committed to a comprehensive, just and lasting solution to the question of Palestine at an early date. We support Palestine's full membership in the UN and urge certain UN security members not to lay obstacles to that end. We call for a more broad-based, more authoritative, and more effective international peace conference to work out a timetable and roadmap for the two-state solution. We believe that Palestine and Israel should resume peace talks as soon as possible to achieve the ultimate goal that they coexist in peace as two states, and the Arab and Jewish peoples live in harmony as two ethnic groups. China will continue to work with the international community to restore peace, save lives, and uphold justice. Thank you. Next question, please. 谢谢主持人，王外长您好，北京青年报记者提问：我们注意到，过去一年来，中国先后为推动沙特和伊朗复交、缓和缅北局势、促进伊朗和巴基斯坦改善关系，采取了外交斡旋行动。这些行动都取得了很好的效果，成效也非常的显著，得到了有关方面和国际社会的高度肯定。有不少人都说，这样的事情只有中国才能做到。我们想问一下您，中国斡旋外交有何成功之道？谢谢。北京 Youth Daily。Over the past year, China mediated the resumption of diplomatic ties between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the de-escalation in northern Myanmar, and the improvement of Iran-Pakistan relations. These diplomatic efforts were quite effective and were highly commended by the relevant parties and the international community. Many say that only China is capable of doing that. Could you share with us what makes China's mediation successful? Constructive engagement in settling international hotspot issues is a due responsibility for China as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. 
we learn from international practices and draw wisdom from Chinese culture. And we have found the Chinese way to address hotspot issues. In my view, the following four commitments are vitally important. First, we still need to uphold a commitment to non-interference in internal affairs. China always respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the countries concerned and plays good offices in light of their needs and wishes and in line with the UN Charter. Second, a commitment to political settlement. In addressing disagreements and disputes, willful use of force should not be allowed, let alone relying obsessively on pressure and sanctions. What is needed is to advance dialogue and consultation with the utmost patience and find the biggest common ground that accommodates the needs of all sides. On all hotspot issues, China always promotes talks for peace. We never add fuel to the fire. Third, a commitment to objectivity and impartiality. China forms its stance based on the merits of each issue. We do not use double standards or favor one side over the other or seek selfish geopolitical interests. All peoples in the world have a sense of justice in their hearts. Credibility comes before influence. Fourth, a commitment to addressing both symptoms and root causes. It's important to deflate tensions as quickly as possible to prevent escalation or spillover. And at the same time, it is also crucial to look into the root causes in a systemic and dialectical way and take a holistic approach to resolving disputes. Band-aid solutions are not advisable, nor are short-sighted utilitarian or finger-pointing tactics. Our world is far from being tranquil, and peace needs to be upheld by us all. We will work with all countries to build consensus for ending conflicts, pave the way for peace talks, and strive for a world of lasting peace and common security. Thank you. Next question. Agencia Efe. Uh, good morning, Lorena Cantor from FA News Agency, Spain. Uh, Mr. Wang, uh, China's relationship with Europe seemed to slightly improve during uh, last year, but there are still some tensions. So uh, what are China's expectations towards its relationship with, with Europe in the forthcoming months? And also, why do you think European countries have so far avoided joining the Belt and Road Initiative? Thank you. Last year was the 20th anniversary of the China-EU Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. The two sides relaunched exchanges and dialogue across the board at all levels. The China-Europe Railway Express ran more than 17,000 cargo trips connecting 219 cities in 25 European countries. It is a lifeline that ensures safe and un unimpeded industrial and supply chains in a turbulent world. China rolled out visa-free policies for quite some European countries, facilitating travels and business exchanges. On the BRI you mentioned, in fact, there have been many successful China-Europe cooperation projects under the initiative, the Budapest-Belgrade railway link, the port of Piraeus in Greece, and the Peleus Arch Bridge in Croatia are just a few typical examples. I remember a few years back, an EU policy paper labeled China as a partner, competitor, and systemic rival at the same time. However, facts have shown that this characterization is neither consistent with reality nor viable. On the contrary, it only caused distractions and created obstacles for China and EU relations. It's like driving to a crossing and finding the red, yellow, and green lights all along at the same time. How can you drive on? In fact, 
China and Europe do not have clashing fundamental interests between them or geopolitical and strategic conflicts. Their common interests far outweigh their differences. In the context of China-EU relations, the two sides should be characterized rightly as partners. Cooperation should be the defining feature of the relationship. Autonomy is key value and win-win its future. We hope that China-EU relations will move ahead smoothly with green lights at every crossing. A strong Europe is in the long-term interests of China. Likewise, a strong China is also in the fundamental interests of Europe. China and Europe should work together to practice multilateralism, advocate openness and development, and facilitate dialogue between civilizations. We are still of the view that in today's world, as long as China and Europe engage in mutually beneficial cooperation, no attempt to create block confrontation will succeed. As long as China and Europe stay committed to openness and win-win, deglobalization will not prevail. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you。谢谢主持人。王毅外长您好。新加坡联合早报提问。台湾选举结束后,外界担忧,台海的紧张局势会进一步的升级,并将冲击区域的和平与稳定。您认为两岸和平统一的前景是否变得更加暗
。外界认为，这是中国亲诚惠荣、周边外交理念在不断生根发芽、开花结果。请问您对今年周边外交有何展望 ？Global Times. China's neighborhood diplomacy in 2023 began with a successful China Central Asia summit and concluded on a high note with the agreement between China and Vietnam to build a community with a shared future that carries strategic significance. It was indeed a busy and fruitful year. Many believe that this shows China's pursuit of neighborhood diplomacy, featuring amity, sincerity, mutual benefit, and inclusiveness, has taken root and come to fruition. How do you envision China's neighborhood diplomacy this year? The Chinese people have a saying that a close neighbor is better than a distant relative. China and its neighboring countries will always be there for each other, and Asia is our common home. Making it a better place is the shared hope of all countries in the region. Since President Xi Jinping initiated our neighborhood diplomacy, featuring amity, sincerity, mutual benefit, and inclusiveness, we have worked with our neighbors to open up new prospects for good neighborliness and friendship, and have found the distinctive Asian way for getting along well with each other. We stay committed to forging friendship with our neighbors. We respect each other's core and major concerns, maintain frequent high-level exchanges, and endeavor to increase mutual understanding and affinity among our peoples. The idea of good neighborliness and friendship has won stronger popular support, and the vision of a community with a shared future has taken root in the hearts of our peoples. We stay committed to treating each other with sincerity. We believe in seeking common ground while shelving differences, accommodating each other's comfort levels, enhancing under understanding and trust through candid kind of communication, and settling differences and frictions through dialogue and consultation. We work together to tackle risks and challenges and stand side by side as good neighbors in trying times. We stay committed to mutual benefit. We make good use of our complementary strength to help each other achieve development and revitalization. A large number of cooperation projects, such as the China Laos Railway, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, the China Central Asia Natural Gas Pipeline, the China Malaysia Twin Industrial Parks, and the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railway, have boosted growth in the region. We stay committed to openness and inclusiveness. We practice open regionalism, take an active part in East Asian cooperation, support ASEAN centrality, and promote deeper and more substantive China, Japan, ROK trilateral cooperation. The China Central Asia Summit and the Lantang Mekong Cooperation Mechanism have made robust progress. The SCO has become a regional organization that covers the largest area and population in the world. This year, marks the 70th anniversary of the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence. Although born in Asia, the Five Principles transcend differences in social system and ideology. They have become basic norms governing international relations and fundamental principles of international law, contributing the wisdom of the East to properly handling state-to-state -state relations. Seventy years later, the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence are not outdated. They are even more relevant and vibrant than ever. China stands ready to work with our neighbors to carry forward the five principles of peaceful coexistence toward building a community with a shared future for Asia and for mankind, so that Asia can continue to contribute to world peace and provide impetus to global growth. Thank you. Next question, please. Good day, Mr. Minister and other members of the panel. I'm from uh, CGTN. Uh, I'm curious, the Ukraine crisis now has dragged on more than two years. And at the Munich Security Conference just last week, uh, you talked about, or last month rather, you talked about all China has done to promote peace, but at the same time saying the conditions are not right to move forward with uh, peace talks at the negotiating table. When do you think conditions will be right, and what are you looking for to continue this pursuit for peace? Thank you. China Global News Service. The Ukraine war has been continuing for two years. Last year, you said that the Munich Security Conference was held in the Munich Security Conference. The Chinese government has done everything to negotiate. Now, the conditions of the negotiation table are not yet ready. 
。您认为条件何时才算成熟？在乌克兰问题上，中方始终秉持客观的立场。China has all along held an objective and impartial position and promoted peace talks. President Xi Jinping had in-depth exchanges with world leaders, including those of Russia and Ukraine. China has also published its position paper, and its special representative has traveled intensively to mediate among different parties. As we speak, he is still during an ongoing trip in the region, and all our efforts point to one goal, that is, to pave the way for ending the conflict and starting peace talks. One strong impression we got at the recent Munich Security Conference is that as more and more people begin to worry about a possible lose-lose outcome, they are ready to create conditions to explore a reliable way out of this crisis. Past experience shows that a conflict, when prolonged, tends to deteriorate and escalate, even to the extent unthinkable for parties concerned. In the absence of peace talks, misperception and miscalculation will accumulate and may lead to an even bigger crisis. Lessons in this regard should not be forgotten. All conflicts have to end at the negotiating table. The earlier the talks start, the sooner peace will arrive. As long as all parties abide by the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and their legitimate concerns are properly addressed, I believe a balanced, effective, and sustainable security architecture can and will be established in Europe. President Xi Jinping has put forward four points about what must be done. They are China's fundamental guide in seeking a political settlement of the Ukraine crisis. China supports the holding in due course of an international peace conference that is recognized by both Russia and Ukraine and ensures the equal participation of all parties and fair discussions on all peace plans. China looks forward to the early restoration of peace and stability on the European continent. It will continue to play a constructive role to this end. Thank you. Next question, please. 谢谢主持人，外长您好，中新社记者提问。那我们想了解中国外交如何更好地服务中国式现代化。嗯，还有呢，就是外界有一些声音，或是担忧中国的营商环境，甚至是唱衰中国的经济发展前景。我们想了解对此您有哪些回应？谢谢。China News Service, how will China's diplomacy better serve Chinese modernization? Some have expressed concerns over China's business environment and a pessimistic view on its economic prospect. What is your response? In fact, yesterday, many some Chinese ministers were here, and they took questions from the media. And today, I'm also happy to take your question. As you may know, last year, China's economy grew by 5.2% last year, contributing to one-third of global growth. It shows that China remains strong as an engine for growth. The next China is still China. I also wish to draw your attention to a number of new trends. First, China's development is driven not only by a reasonable growth in quantity, but also an effective upgrade in quality. Emerging industries are booming. Green transition has yielded impressive outcomes. Social expectation is improving steadily. And new quality productive forces are taking shape at a faster pace. Second, China's supersized market with over 1.4 billion people is unleashing opportunities for the world. The explosive growth of new demands and new business forms is rapidly expanding the room for China's own development and for its cooperation with the world. Third, China is opening its door wider as more substantive steps are taken in its high-standard institutional opening up. China's overall tariff has been reduced to a level similar to developed country members of the World Trade Organization.
Negative list for foreign investment is shortened to less than 31 items. All restrictions on foreign investment access in the manufacturing sector have been lifted. Opening up in the service sector is being advanced. Return on investment for foreign businesses is still one of the highest in the world. China prospers through interaction with the world, and the world becomes better off when China does well. Spreading pessimistic views on China will end up harming oneself, and misjudging China will result in missed opportunities. Economic diplomacy is an important part of our external work. We will continue to take steps to facilitate visits in China, including more convenient payments. I wish to share with you that starting from March the 14th, China will further extend on a pilot basis visa exemption to six countries, including Switzerland, Ireland, Hungary, Austria, Belgium, and Luxembourg. We hope more countries will offer Chinese citizens visa, visa facilitation and work with us to build fast-track networks for cross-border travels and encourage speedy resumption of international passenger flights. This will make it more convenient for Chinese citizens to travel abroad and make foreign friends feel at home in China. We will organize more tours outside the capital city for foreign diplomats in China and build more bridges for local governments and businesses to engage in international cooperation. We will work with competent departments to work on the negotiation and signing of more high-standard free trade agreements expanding a global-oriented network of free trade areas and safeguarding the steady and smooth functioning of global industrial supply and data chains. We will join efforts to strengthen the various platforms for international cooperation, including the China International Import Expo, the China International Fair for Trading Services, the China International Consumer Products Expo, and the China International Supply Chain Expo. We will continue to make the business environment more market-oriented, law-based, and up to international standards in an effort to stabilize expectations and provide longer-term benefits to global investors and partners. Thank you. Next question, please. Antara News Agency. Thank you. Question from Antara Indonesia National News Agency. In July 2023, China and ASEAN member countries agreed to a foster the negotiation for a binding code of conduct for uh, South, East, South China Sea. Uh, but regarding this kind of situation currently, uh, is China still optimistic for the negotiation? And if so, what does China offer for more uh, harmonious and peaceful for the code of conduct in South China Sea? Thank you. Yingni Antala Tong Xun Shu. 2023年7月,中国与东盟国家一致同意推动谈判,推进达成具有约束力的南海行为准则。为营造南海和平和谐环境,中方将在推动达成南海行为准则方面提出什么方案? The Chinese people have lived by and worked in the South China Sea for generations. Since early days, the South China Sea Islands have been territories under the jurisdiction of the Chinese government in accordance with the law. Nowadays, the South China Sea is the busiest, safest, and freest waterway in the world. For decades, 50% of the world's merchant vessels have sailed through this waterway, accounting for one-third of maritime trade, and this has never been disrupted or hampered. Despite the turbulence in the world, peace and stability in the South China Sea have been maintained thanks to the collective efforts of China and ASEAN countries. This does not come by easily and should be dearly cherished. The most important experience we have drawn is that we must adhere to two principles. First, differences should be properly managed and resolved through dialogue and consultation or negotiation between states directly involved. Second, peace at the sea should be upheld by China and ASEAN countries working together. These are also the core principle in the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea, signed in 2002. On maritime disputes, China has been exercising a high degree of restraint. We maintain that parties should find solutions 
that are acceptable to each and all by working in the spirit of good neighborliness and friendship and on the basis of respecting historical and legal facts. But abusing such good faith should not be allowed. Distorting maritime laws cannot be accepted. In the face of deliberate infringements, we will take justified actions to defend our rights in accordance with the law. In face of unwarranted provocation, we will respond with prompt and legitimate countermeasures. We also urge certain countries outside the region not to make provocations, pick sides, or stir up troubles and problems in the South China Sea. On upholding peace and stability in the South China Sea, it is important that China and ASEAN countries continue to impl implementing the DOC and at the same time accelerate negotiations on the COC and establish regional rules that are more effective, substantive, and in line with the international law, including law of the sea, with strong efforts from China. The second reading of the COC was successfully completed, and procedures for the third reading launched. We'll work with ASEAN countries to strive for an early conclusion of the COC and ensure that the South China Sea remains a sea of peace and cooperation. Thank you. Next question, please. Hello,主持人,我是凤凰卫视凤凰网凤凰秀的记者 Phoenix TV. The international community closely follows the development of artificial intelligence, and one after another, proposals were introduced for global AI governance. China also proposed its global AI governance initiative. In China's view, what should be done to ensure that AI develops in a way that is truly conducive to the progress of human civilization? And what is China's position on cooperation between major countries on AI? Artificial intelligence is now at a, a crucial stage of explosive growth. We believe that there should be equal emphasis on development and security. New things and new opportunities should be embraced, and at the same time, breaks should be checked before setting off. Concerted efforts are needed to advance global governance on AI. The Global AI Governance Initiative put forward by President Xi Jinping last October has clearly laid out China's position and proposals. Our main focus is to ensure three principles are met. First, ensure that AI is a force for good. Development of AI should be conducive to the welfare of all humanity, in line with ethics and norms, in conformity with the rules of international law, and in keeping with the trend of human civilization. Second, ensure safety. AI should always be placed under human control, with constantly improving interpretability and predictability. For that purpose, plans should be made to assess and control various kinds of risks. Third, ensure fairness. An international AI governance institution should be set up under the UN framework, and all countries be able to participate on equal terms in the process of AI development and sharing its benefits fairly. I wish to stress that attempts to create small yard high fence in AI development would result in mistakes with historic consequences. Such attempts cannot block other countries' technological development. They would only fragment international industrial and supply chains and undercut humanity's ability to tackle risks and challenges. China takes an active and open approach on AI cooperation with other countries and has established dialogue mechanisms with a number of countries. In the field of AI, cooperation between major countries is vital, so is capacity building for developing countries. 
So we will submit in due course to the UN General Assembly a draft resolution on enhancing international cooperation on capacity building of artificial intelligence in order to encourage technology sharing among parties, bridge the AI divide, and leave no one behind. Next question, please. Zanzibar Broadcasting Corporation. Thank you. From Zanzibar Broadcasting Corporation. Um, recent years have witnessed the Chinese senior officials regular visit in African countries, uh, including, uh, including Chinese foreign ministers visit in January um, as a continuation of the tradition of Chinese foreign ministers make their first overseas trip um, to, to Africa at the beginning of the new year. So what will China uh, do to consolidate its cooperation with African countries? As well, I notice senior officials from uh, US and other Western countries also paid a frequent visit to Africa in recent years. How does China look at these trips and China's uh, concerned about the competition from the Western relation with Africa? Thank you. Tanzania, Zanzibar, Guangbo, Tai. 近年来,中国高官频繁访问非洲,就包括中国外长今年一月访非,延续了中国外长每年首访必到非洲的传统。Chinese foreign ministers start their overseas visit every year with a trip to Africa. This is a tradition that has continued for 34 years. This is unique in the history of international exchanges. It is so because China and Africa are brothers treating each other with sincerity and sharing a common future. We have fought shoulder to shoulder against imperialism and colonialism. We have supported each other in pursuit of development. We have always stood for justice in a changing international landscape. Since the start of the new era, President Xi Jinping has put forth the principle of sincerity, real results, amity and good faith, and called for taking the right approach to friendship and interests. The endeavor of building a China-Africa community with a shared future has thus been steered onto a fast track. China has remained Africa's biggest trading partner for 15 years straight, and the pie of China-Africa cooperation is growing bigger. The Chinese and African people are feeling closer to each other. The global south, including China and Africa, is growing fast and profoundly shaping the course of world history. African countries are experiencing a new awakening. Models imposed from outside have brought Africa neither stability nor prosperity. African countries need to explore development paths suited to their national conditions and keep their future and destiny firmly in their own hands. In this new historical process, China will continue to stand firmly with our African brothers and supports an Africa that is truly independent in thinking and ideas. China will assist Africa in building capacity for self-driven development and support faster modernization in Africa. China always holds that Africa should not be marginalized. While China-Africa cooperation thrives, other major countries have again turned their eyes to Africa. China welcomes that. We hope that, like China, all sides will pay greater attention to Africa and increase input to support Africa's development and support the development with real actions. On the basis of respecting the will of Africa, China stands ready for more trilateral and multilateral cooperation. The next meeting of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation will be held in China this autumn. Chinese and African leaders will gather in Beijing again after six years to discuss future development and cooperation and exchange governance experience. I believe 
that through this summit, China and Africa will enhance their long-standing friendship and deepen unity and collaboration to open up new vistas for faster common development and start a new chapter for China-Africa community with a shared future. Thank you. Next question, KBS, please. Hanguangbokungse Korean Broadcasting System. On the Korean Peninsula issue, China has stated the three principles of promoting peace and stability, denuclearization, and settlement through dialogue and consultation. Are these still the positions of the Chinese government? Recently, tensions have been rising on the Korean Peninsula. Where does China see a way out of it? <laughs> The Korean Peninsula issue has been lingering for years. It has a clear root cause, that is, Cold War vestiges persist, a peace mechanism remains absent, and the security issue is yet to be fundamentally resolved. It also has a ready script. This is what China envisages as the dual-track approach and the principle of phased and synchronized actions. Currently, tensions are rising on the peninsula. This is not what China wants to see. The world is turbulent enough. Renewed conflict and turmoil should not happen on the peninsula. Anyone trying to use the Korean Peninsula issue to revive the retrogressive Cold War confrontation will be held accountable by history. Anyone undermining regional peace and stability will pay a heavy price. China maintains a consistent position on the issue. All our efforts come down to one thing, to champion peace, stability and lasting security on the peninsula. The imperative now is to desist from acts of deterrence and applying pressure and move out of the spiral of escalating confrontation. The fundamental solution lies in resuming dialogue and negotiation, addressing the legitimate security concerns of all parties, especially those of the DPRK, and advancing the political settlement of the Korean Peninsula issue. Thank you. Next question, please. 谢谢主持人中央广播电视总台国广记者提问发挥的作用，那么对于联合国的发展和改革又有怎样的主张？谢谢。China Radio International, with global challenges emerging one after another, the international community looks to the United Nations to play a bigger role. But some major countries try to bypass the UN and form all sorts of small circles, which undermines the UN-centered international system. The UN will hold the Summit of the Future this year and celebrate its 80th anniversary next year. How does China see the role of the UN in, in international affairs, and what are China's suggestions for the reform and development of the UN? China always believes that there is only one system in the world, i.e. the international system with the UN at its core. There is only one order, i.e. the international order underpinned by international law. And there is only one set of rules, i.e. the basic norms of international relations based on the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. No country should do whatever suits it or reinvent the wheel. 
The crises and challenges seen in recent years serve as a repeated warning that the role of the UN should be strengthened, not weakened, and the status of the UN must be upheld, not replaced. Over the last 70 years and more since its founding, the UN has withered wind and rain and withstood the impact of power politics. It remains the most universal, representative and authoritative intergovernmental organization. The core mechanism for achieving world peace and development and an important flat platform for the many small and medium-sized countries to participate in international affairs as equals. China is the first country to have signed on the UN Charter. China is the biggest contributor of peacekeepers among the permanent members of the Security Council and the second largest contributor to the UN's regular budget and peacekeeping assessment. In response to the development deficit, we advanced the Global Development Initiative as a boost to the implementation of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In response to the climate threat, we support UN-led international cooperation on climate change and will make the world's biggest cut in carbon emission intensity in the shortest time frame ever seen in history. At the same time, the UN also needs to reform and improve in keeping with the times to adapt to the new realities of international political and economic development and to increase the representation and say of developing countries. Major countries in particular need to assume their responsibilities and help the UN, including its Security Council, to better fulfill its mandate, build global consensus more effectively, mobilize global resources, and coordinate global actions. China supports the UN in holding the summit of the future and reaching a pact for the future that benefits all parties. We will work with the international community to support the continuous development and improvement of the UN, taking international rule of law as the basis, fairness and justice as a principle, win-win cooperation as the goal, and effective action as an orientation, we will practice true multilateralism and promote greater democracy and rule of law in international relations. Thank you. Next question, please. Associated Press of Pakistan. I represent Associated Press of Pakistan. Over the past 10 years, since President Xi Jinping put forward the Belt and Road Initiative, many countries have felt the tangible benefits from the initiative. Last year, China held the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, a grand event indeed. Even some Western media noted that the Belt and Road Initiative bears increasing significance in today's international landscape. Could you share the outlook for Belt and Road cooperation in the next stage? Thank you. Pakistan Association President Xi Jinping has raised the awareness of the importance of since President Xi Jinping put forward the BRI more than 10 years ago, Belt and Road Cooperation has indeed produced fruitful outcomes. The BRI has become the most popular global public good and the largest platform for international cooperation. It has also become a pathway to cooperation, opportunity and prosperity for partner countries seeking joint development. At the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, President Xi Jinping announced eight major steps that China would take. This marks a new stage in high-quality development of Belt and Road Cooperation. China will work with all parties to uphold the Silk Road spirit, deliver on the outcomes of the forum, and usher in a second golden decade of Belt and Road Cooperation. We will promote the upgrading of physical connectivity. 
We will continue to develop a multidimensional global infrastructure connectivity network that is high quality, sustainable and resilient and covers sea, land and air. We will accelerate the development of a digital Silk Road, redouble efforts to build a green Silk Road and work with BRI partners in addressing various new challenges. We will promote the strengthening of institutional connectivity. We will stay committed to the principle of planning together, building together, and benefiting together, stick to the philosophy of open, green, and clean cooperation, and keep to the goal of pursuing high-standard, people-centered, and sustainable cooperation. We will seek greater synergy between the BRI and the development strategies of all sides, promote both signature projects and small and beautiful programs, and make active efforts for an open world economy. We want to make the BRI a lasting opportunity shared by all. We will promote the deepening of people-to-people -people connectivity. We will have more intercivilizational dialogue among BRI partners, support non-governmental and subnational exchanges, and carry out a wide range of cultural and people-to-people -people interactions so that the Silk Road spirit will take hold in people's hearts. The type of modernization China pursues is not one that benefits China alone. We hope that high-quality Belt and Road cooperation will serve as an engine of the common development of all countries and, a, and an accelerator for the modernization of the whole world. Next question, please. Prensa Latina. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Prensa Latina, News Agency. Minister, the strength of the Global South grew significantly last year. Cuba successfully hosted the summit of the Group of 77 and China, while the BRICS mechanisms achieved historic expansion. Some Western media outlets and scholars believe that the rise in Global South is challenging the international order led by the West. As an important member of the Global South, China has played an important role. What is China coming on this matter? Thank you. Gubala 新中国家发展壮大, a stronger BRICS means growing force for peace and increasing support for justice. It should not be seen as a challenge. In a broader sense, BRICS expansion reflects the collective rise of the global south and the world evolving faster toward multipolarity, consisting of emerging markets and developing countries the Global South now takes up over 40% of the world economy, changing the global economic landscape in a profound way. Independence is its distinct quality, and seeking strength through unity is its tradition. The Global South is no longer the silent majority, but a key force for reforming the international order and a source of hope as the world undergoes profound changes unseen in a century. China was, is, and will be a steadfast member of the Global South. We go through thick and thin and head toward a shared future together with countries of the South, and we are always a crucial force for the development and prosperity of the Global South. This year will be a year of harvest for Global South cooperation and a new starting point for unity among Asian, African, and Latin American countries. The China-Arab States Cooperation Forum will celebrate its 20th anniversary. The china CELAC Forum will count 10 years of productive cooperation. Another FOCAC summit will take place in China this coming autumn. China looks forward to jointly celebrating the milestones with various parties and continuing 
to promote unity and cooperation among developing countries to augment the strength of the South. China also supports Russia in holding the summit of the Greater BRICS following its membership enlargement and supports Brazil and Peru in holding the G20 Leaders Summit and the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting, respectively, to jointly create a shining South moment in global governance. Thank you. Next question, please. Xinhe 那么他们还注意到了实施了领事保护与协助条例推出了中国领事小程序等等。那么网友想请问外长,今年外交部在外交为民方面还有哪些新的举措?谢谢。China Daily, our netizens noted that last year more than 1500 Chinese nationals were evacuated from Sudan and returned to safety in China. The regulations on consular protection and assistance was put into action, and the China Consular Affairs mini-program was launched. What more can we expect this year from the Foreign Ministry in terms of diplomacy for the people? I wish to thank our internet users for your care and support for China's diplomacy. And I'm very glad to take up the questions that are of interest to them. In a year of changes and confusion around the world, the CPC Central Committee kept close to its heart the safety of all Chinese compatriots abroad. Throughout the year, the ministry and our missions all over the world spared no effort to bring heartwarming care from the CPC Central Committee to all compatriots in time. We strengthened consular protection abroad, handling more than 80,000 cases of various types and issuing more than 6,000 reminders and alerts. We evacuated thousands of Chinese nationals from Sudan, Palestine, Israel and other places doing our best to protect the life and safety of Chinese nationals abroad. We continue to improve the functions of the China Consular Affairs app and responded to more than 530,000 calls seeking help on the consular service hotline 12308. We made the Chinese passport stronger. More than 20 countries such as Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand now have mutual visa waivers with China for all types of passports. China also promulgated its first regulations on consular protection and assistance to make for law-based, institutionalized and standardized consular protection. Practicing diplomacy for the people is a ceaseless endeavor. This year we'll focus on three priorities. First. We will make full efforts to strengthen the system for the protection of Chinese nationals and interests abroad. We'll spread the knowledge about consular protection, work more effectively to issue security risk alerts, further improve the 12308 hotline, and provide efficient, responsive, and whole process services on the consular protection platform. Second, we will continue to build fast-track networks for cross-border travels. We will work for faster recovery of international passenger flights and make arrangements with more countries for visa-free travels and multi-year, multi-entry visa options. Third, we'll continue to improve in-person and online consular services. We'll upgrade the China Consular Affairs app and equip our missions abroad with smart consular service centers to deliver finer and easier consular services to overseas Chinese. My message is this. China carries out diplomacy for its people. Serving the people and meeting our compatriots' expectations is our abiding mission. Thank you. Thank you. In the interest of time, we will now take the last question. Thank you, 
归功于中国外交官的积极努力。请问王外长，您认为新时代中国故事的亮点和重点是什么？讲好中国故事有何重要意义？外国记者在讲好中国故事方面又能发挥什么样的作用？谢谢。China Arab TV. Last year, China's voice grew stronger in the world, and more are hoping to learn about China's stories. Much of the credit should go to Chinese diplomats for their active work. Mr. Minister, what, in your eyes, is most fascinating and notable about China's stories in the new era, and why is it important to tell engaging stories about China? What can foreign journalists do in communicating China's stories? Are you the one who danced uh, on, online, the Kumusan dance? Are you still doing it? This is a very good question, and I think it's uh, very fitting to be our final question today. Over the past few years, foreign journalists in China have covered many lively stories about China, from a string of Shenzhou space missions to the Fendouzhe submersible diving in the deepest oceanic trench, from reversing desertification to promoting low-carbon lifestyle, from the Asian Games in Hangzhou to the basketball games in rural Guizhou province called VBA, you have told the world inspiring stories of 1.4 billion people working as one for the Chinese dream. You have shown the world a vibrant China in the new era. Let me take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation for the good work of our friends from the media. China's stories are fascinating. They're first and foremost stories of the CPC. For over a century, the CPC has rallied and led the Chinese people in a tireless endeavor, blazing the Chinese path to modernization and creating development miracles unseen in human history. This is the leading theme of the stories about China. China's stories are essentially stories of the Chinese people, the people are the lead characters of China's stories. Under the leadership of the CPC, the 1.4 billion plus Chinese people have been working tenaciously and building happy lives with their own hard work. This is the most notable chapter in China's stories. China's stories are also stories of common progress of China and the rest of the world. China keeps its development closely linked with that of other countries. Taking determined steps to reform and open up, China has grown stronger and brought benefits to the world. This is the most far-reaching part of China's stories. You ask why good storytelling about China is important. People need to realize that China's stories do not exist in isolation. They are instead important chapters of the stories of humanity. They speak to a truth. When countries proceed from their own national conditions to explore modernization paths, they will together make up a new, colorful vista of world modernization. There are now more and more foreign journalists telling China's stories. I've learned that one of them sees it as a lifelong mission. Because China is a place that makes the impossible possible. So he believes this is not just a job, but a mission for him. I can see also more foreign influencers becoming popular with viewers from around the world for sharing their experiences in China. More foreign friends are welcome to join us in telling the stories of an energetic, bustling China and of China working hand in hand with other countries to build a community with a shared future for mankind. Thank you once again. Thank you. Friends from media, that is the end of the press conference today. Thank you, Minister Wang Yi. Thank you, Thank you all. Friends from the media, this press conference now concludes. Thank you, Minister Wang, and thank you all. A live press conference there in Beijing.
on China's diplomacy and foreign affairs presided over by Mr. Wang Yi. A total of 21 questions were raised from members of the press covering a wide range of topics, everything from China's major country diplomacy, um, head of state diplomacy to China's relations with members of the global south to China's vision and ideas on global governance as well as building a community of a shared future for mankind. Let's talk about that press conference with my guests here in the studio. Um, gentlemen, a lot of consistency in China's diplomacy as you would hear from the foreign minister um, on a number of topics. He said, you know, China's stance is clear, China's position is clear. A lot of consistency, some fresh expressions, um, of course, uh, metaphors about china eu relations with that traffic lights metaphor and new expressions like that. So can I ask both of you, starting with Dr. Zhao here, your general impression of what was covered in that press conference? Well, indeed, like you said, um, in very short 90 minutes, um, Foreign Minister Wang Yi basically packed China's uh, from principle to uh, implementation of China's foreign policy uh, into this very short period of time. Uh, there's a lot of uh, content. I'm still uh, processing this. But uh, first comes to my mind is that, um, uh, as you said, China's foreign policy is very clear. And Foreign Minister is very frank and open about China's foreign policy and answering those very difficult questions about uh, global challenges. And the second thing is that uh, I think he pointed out that in this year, 2024, China will have more initiatives and more foreign policy uh, activities uh, that will uh, uh, improve China's relations with uh, Global South, uh, with Africa, with Southeast Asia, with Latin America. Uh, there are many things ahead, uh, and China is going to continue to push its own agenda. And also on uh, great power relations, China uh, also will have um, improved relations with Russia, for instance, and uh, trying to stabilize the relationship with the United States and also with the EU. So many things are covered, uh, areas covered, and I think there's a lot more to talk about later. Mm. Dr. Cavolo, what stood out for you from that press conference? In fact, I, I have a very imp positive uh, impression about uh, this uh, conference press given by the Minister Wang Yi. And we can see that the, the China, uh, there are several uh, talks, of course, and we can see a different kind of talks. And we can see that China is committed with the uh, true multilateralism, also an equal multipolar world, a constructive engagement in all these kind of talks, a reform of the uh, global uh, international system. Then he mentioned about the United Nations, you know, the commitment with the United Nations at the core of the international relations and also the rule of law, international arena. Uh, and uh, so uh, China as a second largest economy in the world has now a diplomacy that cover several kind of aspects and the whole world. So this is the reason why a conference like this, we can see different kinds of media from different parts of the country, of, of the world. So this, this reflects the importance of China now. Mm. Gentlemen, before we continue on with our discussion, uh, let's listen to some of the remarks made by uh, Mr. Wang Yi just now. He says China has achieved fruitful diplomatic outcomes over the past year with the head of state diplomacy playing a strategic guiding role. He also says China will continue upholding multilateralism and promoting greater democracy in international relations. Take a listen. The year 2023 not only witnessed pioneering efforts, but also great harvests in China's diplomacy. Under the strong leadership of the CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at its core, the Chinese Foreign Service fully implemented the guiding principles set forth at the 20th CPC National Congress. We took steps to promote international solidarity and cooperation and offered solutions to crises and challenges. We contributed toward peace and development and broke new ground in China's diplomatic theory and practice. In the past year, President Xi Jinping hosted two major diplomatic events in China, attended three multilateral summits, made four important overseas visits, and had more than 100 meetings and phone calls. 
Head of State Diplomacy is getting increasingly irreplaceable in providing strategic guidance. We will uphold fairness and justice and further establish the ethos of China's diplomacy. We will practice true multilateralism and promote greater democracy in international relations. On issues of principle concerning the legitimate rights and interests of developing countries and the future of humanity, we will be more unequivocal and we will shoulder greater moral responsibility and press ahead in the right direction of history. Gentlemen, we talked about this earlier in the show, a huge diplomatic year for China in 2023. The president's visits, overseas visits, were a highlight. China taking the initiatives to hold events here in China, such as the China Central Asia Summit, the third Belt and Road Summit, they were a highlight in China's mediation efforts in regional conflicts and for um, countries to resume diplomatic relations were a highlight. Uh, Dr. Cavolu, what were the biggest highlights for you for China's diplomacy last year? I think the, Belt and Road, the third Belt and Road Forum, because it is announced that this project that completes 10 years uh, is still is important and uh, has some more projects to the future. It means that the Belt and Road Cooperation enhanced its policy coordination, its infrastructure, the trade, the people-to-people -people exchange. And uh, the President Xi Jinping announced that time, and the Minister Wang Yi mentioned in his conference now eight, eight major yeah. steps, right? For example, a, a new international land sea trade corridor, the air silk road, pilot zones for Silk Road e-commerce, for example. And I would like to mention something that I think is important. Uh, the President Xi Jinping also announced a lot of initiatives connect with the museum's alliance. It's Silk Road Alliance of Museums, Libraries, a Theater. It shows that the culture is also something important to this, this uh, initiative, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. And, you know, when we see part of the Western countries uh, facing a kind of darkness period of the time with xenophobia, discrimination, you know, anti-science discourse. China offers to the world an initiative that tries to bring what? Art, culture, more dialogue. And this is the reason why I used to say the, the, that this is a kind of a enlightenment multilateralism, and this is good. You know, for, for the world. That that's a good way, certainly, on. to put it. An exchange of civilizational outcomes and fruits, if you will. And if you look at the eight major steps announced at this summit, you can count on the Belt and Road Initiative to continue with strong force. Um, on top of the accomplishments and deliverables we've already seen um, by now. Uh, Dr. Zhao, can I also ask you about this? Um, what stood out for you? Well, um, what struck me uh, most and most freshing, uh, I think, uh, foreign policy coming out of China last year is China is becoming a major international mediator for conflicts. And that's uh, very much an implementation of China's global security initiative, uh, which means, and I, in this conference, press conference, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi particularly laid out four principles for China's mediation, uh, which means, uh, number one, non-interference, Number two, impartiality. Uh, number three, uh, political, uh, insisting on political settlement. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, address both symptom and origin of the conflict. And that is very important because previously other countries and even uh, many European countries played a role in me uh, intermediating uh, global conflicts. Uh, however, sometimes um, uh, countries like the United States often are partial. Uh, playing their role, uh, you know, closer to one party against the, another. So there's no like equal and balanced outcome of those mediation. And some countries also played a role, but they're too small. They have limited influence. For China to come out, promote peace, and trying to bring two parties together, uh, we achieved quite a success in within one year. As uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi pointed out, that we have successfully bridged difference between Iran and Saudi Arabia, also in Myanmar, and as well as in Pakistan-Iran conflicts. So those are uh, important things, and other countries are looking at China for further uh, activities in trying to bring peace in uh, Ukraine conflicts, for instance, and also in Gaza.
Great points, great influence, and great outcomes. Gentlemen, let's hear more from that press conference where Wang Yi also talks about China-U.S. relations. He says that China has always kept its policy stable and stresses three principles. Our position is the three principles proposed by President Xi Jinping, mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. They are a statement of the experiences and lessons of the 50-plus years of China-U.S. relations and represent the right way for interactions between major countries. They should be observed and acted upon by both sides. Specifically, mutual respect is the precondition because interaction sustains only when differences in social and political systems are respected and acknowledged. Peaceful coexistence is the baseline, because conflict and confrontation between two major countries like China and the U.S. have unimaginable consequences. Win-win cooperation is the goal, because when working together, China and the U.S. can do great things, conducive to the two countries and the world. I mean, it's certainly a very positive thing that both countries are acknowledging an improvement since San Francisco. That's what both leaders wanted. That's what both peoples wanted. But obviously, when Mr. Dell talked about perceptions, it seems that the misperceptions continue from the U.S. side. And obviously, Mr. Wang Yi was disappointed that the promises made by the U.S., um, a lot of them unfulfilled. So, uh, Dr. Zhao, uh, what do you make of the statements from um, Mr. Wang, uh, the foreign minister Wang Yi here, on what has been achieved and what has not been achieved since San Francisco? Well, uh, I think uh, there are problems on both sides, but primarily on American side. So I think after the summit, uh, and even before that, uh, our foreign minister Wang Yi has said that very clearly that China's principle last uh, is deriving from 50 plus years of ex experience. And those three, three principles apply to this very major, very important uh, critical relationship. And uh, considering that both uh, U.S.-China relationship does not just influence bilateral relationship, but also has major impact on global, uh, you know, international system. So it's really important for both countries shoulder this responsibility to maintain a stable, viable, you know, a relationship, and also trying to cooperate on uh, major challenges on global stage. So at this point, I think. Uh, the uh, President Biden and U.S. administration made some promises. However, they didn't deliver. And the reason is very clear, that domestically there is barriers for the U.S. to execute and uh, to commit to their commitment uh, to China. So I think without uh, you know, seriously addressing domestic problems and also without a bold and uh, the encouragement uh, uh, on the U.S. leadership, it's very difficult for the U.S to go through their promises. And also, I think, uh, moving ahead, I think there's more barriers. Uh, and I think it's very difficult for the United States to come up with the right solution and right perception on China. So I think at this point, the world needs to understand that it's not uh, that, that uh, China-U.S. relationship is not um, uh, having this major uh, problem or barrier from Chinese side. We are very open and very consistent on how to deal with the United States. And I think a fair competition between the two sides, as Foreign Minister Wang Yi has said, is welcome. However, this competition should not be considered as a threat, and the U.S. should not respond in absurdity. He used the word absurdity, right? And a recent uh, um, Commerce Secretary Raimondo's comment on China's EV entering into the U.S. market is really absurd. She basically said that China can turn off and made millions of cars stay uh, put uh, on the road in the United States, and somehow China can turn all those vehicles into spy uh, uh, machines. So I think with this kind of paranoia coming out of the United States, it's really hard to sit down and have a reasonable dialogue and have a rational policy between these two countries. And hopefully the U.S. come up with some solution on this. Paranoia is such a vivid word here. I mean, mis we talked about misperception. This is misperception exaggerated to an absurd level here. And you, you hear from um, the foreign minister's concerns about the suppression and the restrictions coming from the U.S. side, um, saying something 
as you know, keeping China at the uh, lower end of the value chain here. So this mentality from the U.S. side, Dr. Cavallo, I'm wondering about your take on this because uh, Dr. Zhao just talked about the barriers I had, the challenges I had with the U.S. Uh, election coming up again, especially with Donald Trump's um, lead in the Republican nomination. China could come up again very much in the upcoming U.S. election. What do you make the barriers ahead um, in 2024? Yes, the, f the first barrier is this uh, uh, misperception about uh, China's intention or China's uh, Chinese foreign policy. If, uh, I, uh, as I've said before, you know, the grammar is completely different, and sometimes I feel that the, uh, what U.S. says is different from uh, their attitude. So in diplomacy, the word is very important, counts. And then we negotiate words, and then we expect from the order that the, what we negotiate must be uh, obeyed by, by, by all, all sides. These are important part in diplomacy. And uh, I feel that sometimes uh, the Chinese side is, is uh, disappointed, you know, because they put a lot of effort negotiating something with the United States and sometimes accepting uh, some conditions, etc. And uh, there is an expectation that that agreement be obeyed or observed by both parties. And this is important. This is the common ground they are negotiating there. We know that there is a lot of competition. Uh, I think that uh, it's important to what the, the, the foreign minister said, you know, the mutual respect. And uh, in this way, uh, we need to understand the view of the order, the needs of the order, and try, of course, to bring uh, 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 our uh, the ob Chinese objective, considering the U.S. objective, but of course in a peaceful coexistence. And uh, finally, I would like to mention this phrase, if, if I notice, if I note in the right way, but anyway, I think it's important what the, the, the foreign minister said. He said the challenge of U.S. comes from themselves, not from China. And I think uh, he's right. Mm. It's an important point, he said. Mm -hmm. All right, here's something else we wanted to highlight for our viewers. Uh, Wang Yi says China supports an equal and orderly multipolar world. He says this means global affairs should not be monopolized by certain nations, nor should countries be ca ca categorized based on their strengths. China believes in an equal and orderly multipolar world and a universally beneficial and inclusive economic globalization. An equal multipolar world means equal rights, equal opportunities, and equal rules for every nation. Certain or a few powers should not monopolize international affairs. Countries should not be categorized according to their strength. Those with the bigger fist should not have the final say. And it is definitely unacceptable that certain countries must be at the table while some others can only be on the menu. We must ensure that all countries, regardless of their size and strength, are able to take part in decision-making, enjoy their rights, and play their role as equals in the process toward a multipolar world. An orderly multipolar world means all should observe the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and uphold the universally recognized basic norms governing international relations. Multipolarity doesn't mean multiple blocks or fragmentation or disarray. All countries must act within the UN-centered international system and pursue cooperation under global governance. Another interesting metaphor, isn't it? it, it he advocates that it can be that some countries are at the dinner table while others always end up on the menu, obviously referencing what Antony Blinken famously or infamously said um, earlier. Um, uh, multipolarity is such a high frequency word in that press conference. He mentioned it when talking about China promoting relations with Russia, when talking about China supporting global governance. Uh, obviously, this concept is gaining traction here in China, but Dr. Zhao, do you feel like in other parts of the world, multipolarity isn't registering with the politicians there and is losing appeal, as a matter of fact? 
Yeah, I think um, in transitioning uh, from this uh, perhaps unipolar world to multipolar world, and China's uh, trying to champion the cause of multipolar world, there are people who worry about what exactly is a multipolar world and what would be uh, would uh, living under that world look like. And some people think that multipolar world means uh, chaos, means conflict, means uh, fragmentation, and uh, you know multi blocks that competing with each other. So that means instability and a uh, sort of de-globalization uh, in terms of trade. Um, and China is basically saying uh, we're promoting a multipolar world that is equal in rights and also orderly. That means based on international law and led by a UN-centered international system. So it's not chaos. It's not fragmentation. How it's it means more stability and more negotiated uh, peace around the world. So that's I think a evolution of China's foreign policy theory, uh, and that provided a more a brighter and better world than today's world. So I think that's the China solution or China plan. Uh, offered or contributed to, to the world stage. Mm. And the current barrier, of course, are twofold. One is some countries still want to monopolize uh, the, the world uh, system. And uh, sometimes a, a Western dominant world wanted to persist on the world stage. And second is the effort to build small cliques, small circles, and trying to uh, build an exclusive circle instead of inclusive global uh, international system. Mm. So I think China will continue to fight against those ideas and try to bring, uh, develop, you know, global south or developing world into uh, on the table. Uh, and be uh, their own, uh, you know, uh, having their own independent foreign policy and mm. coming together uh, to build a more fair and just international system. Mm. Dr. Kavalu, um, do you feel that this transitional process, as Dr. Zhao just outlined, is still very much happening, is still very much ongoing? Where are we in this process? Is there overall consensus from the global south that this transition must happen and that they should all contribute? I don't know if there is a, no, there is a consensus that the, the, the world must be more multipolar. Mm. And that this is connected with the democratization of the international system. It means give more voice to the developing countries or global south uh, to, to take part in the decision making process. And also they want to be heard by the superpower or powerful countries or developed countries or the, no the glo North global countries. So this is one point. And uh, when we talk about the concrete uh, events, BRICS is one of these uh, that we can see, you know, the global south is uh, uh, joined together in order to, to try to build a new agenda to the world, of course, considering the role, the main role of the United Nations and the chart of the United Nations as a guide for the international relations, but they are building these you know, uh, conditions uh, uh, to take part in the main decision process, as Dr. Zhao mentioned, uh, the, the time that only a small group of countries uh, took decisions to the whole world is over completely, you know. And uh, recently, uh, the African Union joined the G20. So uh, this uh, was uh, an important milestone to the world as well, give to, to the African Union more global, a global influence and also uh, more voice uh, to the Global South. And BRICS successfully expanded last year, so yeah. which was very good news for the Global South and also for their joint efforts to contribute to a multipolar world. Dr. Kavalu, Dr. Dell, thank you so much for your insight and analysis. We appreciate your company on this program. Thank you so much. And with that, we've come to our special coverage today on the press conference on state on foreign affairs and diplomacy here in China. We thank you so much for your company. On behalf of the entire team, thank you so much for watching.